My name is Stephen Rimmer. I'm with Sanam S4 in Brazil. I'm the, the uh, head of business opportunities here. And I'd like you to welcome you to this uh, one hour webinar on science and innovation in Brazil, uh, which I hope you find interesting. I know our visitor today has a lot of information to share with you. So, uh, and I'm sure it's going to be quite revealing to us all of information we, we haven't had before. Um, our guest presenter is Sarah O'Sullivan. She is Director for International Collaboration for Research Brazil, Ireland, and also Education Consultant for Education, Ireland. So uh, uh, she has a strong connection between Ireland and Brazil, and has been working very actively for the last few years on building connections between the two countries, and has built a lot of experience, which she has kindly agreed to share with us. Um, but before I pass the ball to her, um, I'd like to share a poll question, just to get some idea of what our audience, um, what connection our audience has with Brazil at this stage. So um, our moderator will just put on a poll question up in a moment, which is, how aware is your institution of processes for forging research links with Brazil? There are three possible responses there. Are you well aware, somewhat aware, or oh, poor awareness? <coughs> I'll give you 10 seconds to reply and then we'll share our answers. <coughs> right, we'll just get some answers up in a moment. All right, thank you very much for responding. That was pretty fast. All right, so 12% um, well aware, 36% somewhat aware, and 20% poor awareness. That's a, let's hope by the end of this hour that you can change those figures. Right, anyway, enough from me. I think uh, you're wanting to hear from Sarah. Sarah, welcome. Thanks very much for joining us from Rio. Uh, I'll pass the ball to you now. Hi Stephen, hi everybody who's viewing from wherever you're viewing. Um, as Stephen said, I'm Sarah O'Sullivan, um, I'm Irish based here in Brazil and I work both for education in Ireland representing higher education and promoting high, Irish higher education here in Brazil. Also I work for Research Brazil Ireland which is an initiative of the Irish government to promote and support um, research links between our two countries. Um, so I suppose many of us up until a couple of years ago wouldn't have been hugely aware of Brazil in this space. Um, Science Without Borders, I suppose, opened all of our eyes to, to Brazil and I suppose the availability of, um, of scholarships and the, the passage of students coming to our universities. Um, obviously, Science Without Borders, the plan Science Without Borders, the first um, incarnation of the programme, was to send 110,000 students overseas to study. Now, the majority of those, stu those students that were sent overseas were undergraduate students. We believe, and what we're hearing on the ground here in Brazil, is that the second incarnation, which has been called Science Without Borders 2.0 here at the moment, um, will have far more emphasis on postgraduate um, in, in, in the research field. So I suppose that's of interest to all of us as well. Um, when you come to Brazil, obviously anybody who's been to Brazil before will appreciate it's an absolutely massive country. Um, many times larger than Europe, um, 200, 200 million um, population. So where do you start? Is it worthwhile trying to engage here? The distances are huge. Bureaucracy can be quite sticky. Um, there are pros, there are cons. I will explain a lot um, of, of how, how I see it. Um, the pros are there's a lot of very, very interesting research going on here and there's a huge amount of research funding available. The cons can be Sometimes, without knowledge of the Portuguese language, it can be a little bit difficult to access this information. But hopefully, by the end of this presentation, um, we'll have a, we, you'll have a much better idea of how you should go about um, identifying partners and how to move forward in Brazil. Just the pie chart that you'll see on, on your screen there is just how the Science Without Borders scholarships um, so far were, were allocated. So there was a huge, it was 50%, over 50% in the energy and technology space. Um, quite a lot in the biology, biomedical sciences and health space and, and so on and so forth. <coughs> Excuse me. Moving on, I suppose after, after Science Without Borders was launched, the Irish government, um, our science funding agency, which is Science Foundation Ireland, 
decided to allocate funding to, to help promote research links between the two countries. Um, so 11 of our um, universities and institutes of technology came together in a consortium funded by Science Foundation Ireland and we identified these five um, thematic areas that we would like to, that we wanted to link with Brazilian researchers. They were the ICT, uh, Advanced Materials and Nanotechnology, Sustainable Energy and Agro-Production, Biopharmaceutical, Biotechnology and Health and Environmental Science. They would be areas that Irish research would be particularly strong in and they would also be areas that would have matched up with what um, the Science Without Borders programme was looking to achieve. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, just, just to have a look at Brazil for a moment, as I said, there's 200 million people living here. There's about 30 million young people, so under, 20, under 25. So there's a lot of potential students here. I mean, in, in recent years, Brazil has been the kind of wonder story of the world. Um, things have slowed down here for sure. Um, I mean, if, if you look at the GB, GDP in 2011, it was, it was over um, $2 trillion. Things have definitely slowed down here post World Cup, but I suppose I think um, there is a lot of. Um, I believe that the, the, the crisis and the slowdown that we're seeing at the moment, um, I don't think it will necessarily um, impact on research funding because there is a strong belief here that, in, that, re, that um, investment in science and technology and research at the moment is the way to dig Brazil out of any hole before it gets into it. Um, one quite positive thing is the likes of the property market here, which has been um, um, the, the, the value of property has been climbing, climbing, climbing in recent years with the economic growth. Uh, what we saw in Ireland was with, when we hit the crisis, our housing prices dropped. That hasn't happened necessarily in Brazil. So that's kind of there'll be a ray of hope in that as well. Increasing numbers of students studying overseas. Um, Brazil always sent a lot of high school students overseas, a lot of English language students and other language students. The Science Without Borders impact these 101,000 students that have been overseas in all of our universities and are returning. They're talking to people and it's becoming quite trendy for Brazilian students to study overseas as well. And so as well as, as well as these scholarship students, I think there's a lot of fee paying students available and willing to travel here in Brazil. Um, Brazil is, the, is the, the, the science and technology giant in South America, so it can't be, can't be ignored. Um, here in Brazil, most of the research in the, in the STEM areas is conducted in the, in the public sphere. So we have 84 federal universities, 94 state universities, and several uh, research centers, both at federal and state level, as well as technical higher education institutions and, of course, private universities. Um, some of the research strengths, um, Brazil is, 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 is top, really, um, in terms of agriculture. Um, in terms of the, the land math it has, and there is a lot of agricultural research going on here being funded by a state funding agency um, in Brafa. Um, Brazil produces 9% of the world's agricultural science publications, or nearly 7% of the world's plant and animal science publications. Astronomy, um, Brazil is very, very big in astronomy in collaboration with Argentina and, and Chile. Um, nanotechnology is a rapidly growing sector here and um, Brazil is leading, leading the way in Latin America in the nanotechnology sphere. Pharmacology, Brazil will be responsible for, for 4%, 3 to 4% of the world's citations and equally in microbiology and in environment and ecology. Um, in terms of research funding, I suppose we've seen a lot of growth in, in recent years. Um, 10 years ago there was about 17,000 patents being registered annually here in Brazil. Now that number has nearly doubled to, to 30,000. In terms of PhDs, we've seen nearly a, a tripling of the amount of PhDs being approved um, as of the figures 10 years ago. Um, and in terms of research spending as a percentage of GDP, I, I mentioned the, the figures that, that, that um, the, the GDP from a few years ago. In 2010, Brazil was spending 1.16% of its GDP on research. You see that's $25 million. So, I mean, it's not an amount of money to be sniffed at either. Um, 2011, it had risen to by 0.5%, um, and the target is to have it at 2% by 2020. Um, in terms of um, how research funding is allocated, well, the government ministries would dictate um, public policy, and then that would be passed to the to the various funding agencies. So we have CAPES, um, the federal funding agency, which would be responsible for research in all science areas, including humanities. Um, they have, a, have an annual budget of about 900 million US dollars. 
Then CMPQ, which is another federal funding agency. These two federal funding agencies would be the ones that are responsible for Science Without Borders. And I think it's quite important to note here that while Science Without Borders is an excellent, an excellent scheme from our point of view in terms of receiving students and, and available funds, there are a lot more funds and a lot more programs available within CAPIs and within CMPQ. So don't, don't think at any stage that, they are the, that Science Without Borders is your only way into Brazil. It, it's not at all. Um, there's, there's BNDES, which is the Brazilian Development Bank. They spent 33.3 billion reais, and about 11 billion dollars uh, in the first quarter this year. That was a 25% drop on what they spent in the first quarter last year. So I suppose depending on how the economy goes here, there's a lot of money, as you can see, being spent um, federally on, on research. Embrapa, I already mentioned, Embrapa will be responsible for agricultural research. And again, they have an annual budget of about 850 million US dollars. And FINEPI have a, a budget of uh, 4 billion US dollars. Then you have the state funding agencies. So there's a federal law in Brazil that dictates that um, individual states, there's 27 uh, states in Brazil, individual states are obliged by law to set aside a certain amount of their tax, their, their tax intake and dedicate that to research funding. Now, it's important to note here that that research funding is not limited to the STEM areas. Humanities and social sciences are very much included in that, in that idea as well. Jointly, I said there's 25 states, 25, sorry, excuse me, 27 states. 25 of those would have FAPIs, which is Fundação de Pesquisa, foundations to support, uh, to support research. They have a combined budget of about $800 million as well. Um, Industry-wise, we're seeing a lot of international companies coming and setting up research facilities in Brazil. Um, for international companies to come here, it can be difficult, it can be a very bureaucratic uh, market to enter into, but the Brazilian government, both at federal level and at state level, would be putting a lot of effort into, um, and also the universities, would be putting a lot of effort into creating incentives for industry to come and set up here and to create good and long-lasting uh, links with, um, with research, with universities here and with academics here in Brazil. Um, one program that has recently been launched by the Science and Technology Ministry is they plan to develop, over the next 10 years, they plan to develop what they're calling knowledge platforms. So this will be a public-private um, initiative and there will be funding of about 7 billion US dollars um, invested in, in the next 10 years, covering 20, 20 research areas, which I'll show you um, in a moment. And the idea is to unite science leaders um, between, between universities and between, um, between industry. The idea is that um, within that, they will, they will change certain rules. They will remove some of this bureaucracy that I have mentioned to just make it easier to, to link industry with, with, uh, with research here in Brazil. Um, the areas that are being considered for the, for the knowledge platforms will be agriculture, health, energy, aeronautics, advanced manufacturing, ICT, naval and submarine, um, the, the Amazon region, excuse me, um, sorry, I lost that for a second, um, minerals and, and defense also. A recent um, initiative here in Brazil um, was a federal innovation law. So um, whereas in, in many other countries, I suppose, we wouldn't necessarily have federal laws dictating that, that, that we must have innovative practice. But in, here in Brazil, they brought in a federal innovative law, innovation law. And many of the, in fact, most of the FAPIs, the state funding agencies, the 25 of them, most of them would have individual innovation laws at the moment. And the idea with this is that they would just make it easier to create partnerships between universities and industry. It can be difficult. I think what we've in Ireland we have huge linkage between um, between our education sector, between our universities, our institutes of technology, and industry. A lot of the time here in Brazil, while the universities have been trying to create these links, um, a lot of the time industry will come and will take advantage maybe of um, of cheap rent on campus or whatever it might be. But there is not enough linkage between, between the academics in the labs, in the universities, and industry. So the innovation law aims to, aims to change that and just 
give tax breaks if, if, if industry wants to spend on research and development and link with the universities, there will be tax breaks available for them. They will be able to use public, re public funds for the research and they will not have to pay that back again. It just makes it easier to do business between and to link between um, universities and industry. Um, just to have a, a quick look at uh, the Paulista Law of Innovation, which is um, in Sao Paulo. Um, they brought in measures to, again, to, to encourage and regulate partnerships between industry, um, between industry universities and, and um, public research centres. And it just it allows the public research, the public universities and FAPSP to invest in innovative companies and other private enterprises to allow innovation to take place. Now, just a second. Another recent initiative that um, legislation is being drafted at the moment, and the idea is to reduce bureaucracy in scientific activities. A lot of the time, um, the, the, the bureaucratic nature of, of Brazilian society and of Brazilian agencies can make it a little bit difficult to engage. So the idea is to, to make it much, much easier to, um, to engage in scientific partnerships with Brazil. Um, and one constitutional amendment as part of this new law has already been approved by the House of Representatives. It's very much acknowledged here in Brazil, as I already said, that science and innovation, science, technology and innovation are the way forward. It's accepted and I suppose um, the powers that be recognize that the blocks that are in the way at the moment need to be removed or need to be softened. So they are taking and they are taking making efforts to, to make that happen. Um, in Brazil, you have um, several um, the INCTs, uh, the National Science and Technology Institutes. I just have some of them, um, some of them here. Um, we you have um, national research labs in physical sciences, um, pure and applied math, scientific computation, astronomy, and so on and so forth. Um, you, you will find um, the INCTs broken down into these into these specific areas. So they have ten INCTs in agricultural sciences. It's important to take note of the INCTs because if you if you access the list and they have a they have an interactive map map on their site where you can click on individual states. And I suppose if you look at that map, you will see that there's a high concentration there in, um, you see there's 44 there in Sao Paulo, 13 um, INCTs in Minas Gerais, 20 here in Rio de Janeiro. But the good thing about the INCTs is when you when you enter into the information that um, that they provide, you'll find that they're, they're clusters, they're the clusters of scientific excellence here. So while the INCT may be based in Rio de Janeiro, you might find that you have researchers from Amazonas or from several other um, several other states in, in Brazil. So it's a, it's a very good way to get into a network without um, necessarily losing time. So they have 10 INCTs in agricultural sciences, 10 in energy, energy uh, 12 in engineering and IT, 11 in the hard and natural sciences, 10 in the humanities and social sciences, 21 in ecology and environment, 10 in nanotechnology, and they have 39 in health. So I suppose that'll give you an idea of where they're prioritizing as well. Health is a, health is, is a big one. Um, with 200 million people and, 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 and a very varied um, climate, that, that, that's, um, that's an important impact as well. Or a fact. Um, just moving on to the FAPIs. Um, I don't know if they're officially called the FAPIs, but the FAPIs is an easier way to, um, to refer to them. As I already mentioned, there are, there are state foundations, state um, research foundations, not limited to STEM. All research is seen, all, all science is seen as science as, as such. Social sciences, humanities are included. Um, they're funded directly by state taxes. So what you'll find is um, states like Rio de Janeiro, Sao Paulo, Minas Gerais, um, would have the highest concentration of universities, would have the highest concentration of population, uh, would have the highest higher rates of tax entering because of that. Um, so the FAPIs in Rio, Sao Paulo and Minas Gerais, FAPESP, FAPERGI and FAPIMIGI, they have a lot more funds available than the likes of um, funding agencies in the north of Brazil, for example. As well as having more funds available, they also have more people coming to, to, to share the pie. So I think you definitely shouldn't ignore um, any of the FAPIs outside of what you may call the big three or the golden triangle. It's very much uh, worthwhile engaging with, with the other FAPIs as well. And the idea with the FAPIs is they're autonomous foundations. Um, the idea is to, fund, to promote and fund research. 
um, based in the state. So if you talk to FAPESP in Sao Paulo um, and it's research that's going on in Minas Gerais, they don't want to know. It's, it's limited only to researchers and universities or industry that's based in the state of Sao Paulo or in the particular state of um, wherever the FAPI is based. They provide all sorts of funding, funding for PhDs. Um, important to note as well that um, if a PhD student here in Brazil has FAPI funding, um, every, every PhD student, for example, in FAPESP has available funds for overseas travel. So those PhD students would not necessarily be applying to Science Without Borders for sandwich PhD funding. They would be talking to their, their families that are already funding them, funding their stipends here in Brazil. There is funding available very much for doing an overseas part of, um, of their research. Um, there's funding available for postdocs, visiting researchers. Um, both on the state level and on the federal level, um, Brazil very much wants to see academics coming here, um, sharing knowledge, giving lectures, that kind of thing. So, and there's plenty of funding available at federal level um, with with CAPIs and CMPQ, and also at state level with the FAPIs. If anybody is interested in coming, um, make your connections, get to know where you where you will most likely fit here. And um, normally, the applications for coming as a visiting researcher, the applications must be completed by your Brazilian partner, which is just as well because they're very bureaucratic forms and um, they're, they're very formal in terms of the, the Portuguese required. Um, but it's, it's very much an opportunity that's available, it's well funded and it's very much worth looking into. Um, most of the families at this stage would have international partners with um, research councils, agencies, universities, companies all around the world. Um, again, since Science Without Borders um, was, was announced and since the programme started, Floods of universities have been coming from all around the world, some with great offers, some with less great offers. So I suppose engaging with the FAPIs, it's worth um, considering what you can bring to the table because normally uh, in agreement with the FAPIs, one of the expectations when you work in partnership with any of the FAPIs here is that it will be, you will work on a co-fund model. The costs will be split 50-50. So, for example, um, if if um, if Ireland were to were to launch a call with Fabespi, for example, the expectation would be that Fabespi would pay for the costs of um, certainly the mobility of their their. Um, their researchers and Ireland will pay for the cost of the Irish researchers. So rather than any money ever changing hands between FAPI and international partner, whether that's university or an agency or research council, money doesn't change hands. The FAPIs pay for the Brazil side of it and the, the international partners pay for their own side of it. Um, there are 25 FAPIs. Each FAPI has a very different um, research direction and a very, very different priorities. Um, for example, um, in Pernambuco, a priority of theirs would be blue growth based on where they're located um, up, up by the sea there in the north, in the northeast of Brazil. Um, obviously, the FAPI in the state of Amazonas would be very concerned with agricultural and um, forestation uh, research in those areas. Um, so, it, you know, it, it's worth looking in to see where. Where, what are your research um, priorities? Where are you going with your research in order to help identify who may be your partners in terms of individual researchers, in terms of research institutions here, and also in terms of FAPIs? Um, rather than attempting to negotiate with all 25 FAPIs, there is an umbrella organization called CONFAPI. Um, so an engagement with an engagement with CONFAPI can be um, again a very worthwhile and time-saving way of accessing all 25 of these funding agencies. Just to have a look at FAPI funding, um, they have over um, 100, uh, sorry, 800 million US dollars available annually. And um, again, that will dip slightly now with um, with with the, with the slowdown in the economy here. But as you'll see, the, the funding is very much dominated by um, Sao Paulo, Rio de Janeiro, Minas Gerais. But as I mentioned, most people who come here to Brazil to make it to engage, they will start off in Sao Paulo, they will then go to Rio de Janeiro, they will then go to Minas Gerais. They very often will, will not go near Goiás, they will very often not go near Bahia. There is money available in these other states. And I suppose. A lot of the time, when you, when you, if you're starting almost like a cold call situation and you're trying to find a research partner here in Brazil, when you go to, to universities in, in the big three or the golden triangle or whatever you want to call them, 
Um, a lot of the time you'll be met with a bit of fatigue because there's so many universities, so many researchers, so many people coming looking for a cut of the Brazil pie, so to speak. But when you go to other regions in Brazil, they don't have the same amount of, of, of international interest. But as well as that, um, the, and this is speaking more on an individual, individual researcher and university level, the amount of funding that's released federally to the universities here is dependent, or one of the factors at least, that, um, that is dependent uh, or that, that impacts how much funding will be available to the university is internationalization. So when you look at some states up in the north of Brazil, they, they rate very low on, on internationalization. They, there, there's ratings five, six, seven. So a lot of the universities down here in Rio, Sao Paulo, Minas Gerais, they would already have courses that are rated at six and seven. So they would get more funding. When you go up to the north of Brazil or other less visited regions in Brazil, their courses would be level five. That's, that's the way they're rated here. Um, so one way to identify partners would be looking and seeing where, where are the, the, the courses that are rated five and your engagement with them will help them to increase their ratings and that will make the, the funding agencies and the universities look very favorably um, at your proposal, whatever that might be. Um, just having a look at, I'm not going to go into 25 funding agencies, just take a quick look at uh, FAPESCI uh, in, in the state of Sao Paulo. Uh, Sao Paulo has a population of 40 million people. Um, it's responsible, it's, Sao Paulo is the powerhouse of Brazil. It would be responsible for 35% of Brazil's GNP. Um, in, across the families, generally the, the tax intake that is retained for, um, for, for research varies. It can vary from 0.5% up to 2% in some states. In Sao Paulo, the state constitution guarantees 1% of all state tax revenue will go to research. Um, so that's about $500 million annually. Um, important to note, half of Brazil's scientific um, articles published in international journals are sourced from Sao Paulo. Um, again, and I've mentioned this, all research is funded. It's not limited to, to STEM at all. Um, and again, um, funding available for PhDs, for postdocs, for seminars, for uh, participation in international events. There's a, lot of, there's a lot of different funding available. What you'll find is when you go into each FAPI's website, there's a huge amount of information written in very formal Portuguese, and it can be very difficult to fully understand um, what is on offer and how it's on offer. So I suppose I would recommend anybody seriously considering um, engaging or attempting to engage here to, to have somebody at hand that speaks Portuguese and understands Portuguese, just to help you to, to, sift, through, um, to sift through that information. Um, just, um, I don't know how clear it is on the map there, but just that just gives you a, a little bit of an idea of where FAPESB has international partnerships. So they're pretty much uh, reaching all around the world there. They've, they've maybe not so much um, in, in, in some parts, but other parts, they're, they're very, very well engaged. They have a lot of partnerships in Europe. Um, they have some down in Australia and um, several here in South America and lots in, South, in, in, in North America as well. As I mentioned, um, their preference is a, is a co-fund basis. They have a program called Sprint. Um, it's their international program. They have two calls per year um, with nominated universities or nominated uh, uh, research foundations in, in, in different countries. And their, their way of um, ask, uh, assessing the applications is a joint peer review system. Um, again, I mentioned this already. I just I, I gave it an individual slide because this is just um, the sci under Science Without Borders and um, the special visiting researcher. As a researcher, you can spend up to three months a year here in Brazil for up to three years. The expectation would be that obviously to be um, conducting research and delivering classes here um, on in university campuses. They are so eager to have international um, presence, international ideas, international experiences in their labs here. So once you have your Brazilian partner who will write your application for you and with you, um, the success rates are very, very high indeed. So it's a great opportunity to spend time here. And again, I suppose Brazil being such a huge country, if you haven't been to Brazil, come to Brazil because it's very hard to fully understand Brazil without having your feet on the ground here. You need to, you need to spend time here. You need to meet the researchers. You need to visit the labs to, to get an understanding. But just going back to the special visiting research scheme, um, it gives us a, a monthly stipend of almost 5,000 um, US dollars um, and also research grants of about 17,000 US dollars per year, as well as your flights being covered. Um, 
This is just a quick screen grab from Cathy's. So in addition to Science Without Borders, which we all know about, um, these are other calls that, that, are, that are open at the moment. Some are, some are, are, are calls with fixed um, dates, the, the, the open calls, and others are continual calls that you, you can kind of apply for at any time at all. Um, anybody wanting to come to either either to come here and spend some time here or to send a student here or indeed to receive um, receive students um, in Europe specifically this one this is an initiative of the European Union called your access um, your access provides um, just provides support to, to, to researchers for example a young researcher wants to come from Dublin he wants to bring his wife and his kids and he's not sure how will you find accommodation? Where will the child go to school, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera? They, they help with very, very practical information like that. So they have a team here that's based, um, they have, well, half their team is in Brasilia, half their team is here in, in Rio de Janeiro. So very much worth, um, worth connecting with your see what, um, what practical um, advice and help and supports they can offer as well. Um, so finding a Brazilian partner, where do you start? Okay, well, if you have already been receiving um, Brazilian students use your alumni. Where have they come from? What what um, de what departments in the university have they come from? Do you have institutional partnerships with Brazilian universities? Now, if you've been here and you've met Brazilian universities, you will you will often find that before you've even you know before you've even said hello, you've been offered an MOU. Okay, I wouldn't advise signing um, MOUs necessarily willy nilly without having any kind of concept of what's inside them. Um, but institutional partnerships are very important here in Brazil and um, certainly all of the whispers and the rumours that we're hearing here on the ground is that there will be, um, there will be priority given to, to international universities that have, um, that have partnerships with Brazilian universities. Uh, Sciences at Borders, the first phase was launched very, very quickly with no dialogue with the Brazilian universities and they just found it specifically here in the south they found it a brain drain their best students disappeared for a year came back expecting exemptions from subjects and there was very little communication so um while science without borders has been has been a great success in many many ways in terms of opening out brazil and opening these opportunities for partnerships and bringing ourselves all of the foreign universities in here to brazil for a lot of the academics in brazil in the north, they're they're very they're, they love it because it's bringing international attention that they've never had before. In the south, they already had international partnerships. So, um, in order to kind of bring the university sector back on board, certainly the idea here and the thinking here is that the second phase of Science Without Borders institutional partnerships will be um, will be will be rewarded essentially. Um, you have the, on the side. If you if you Google Science Without Borders, finding a partner, you will find several links. Now again, most of them are in Portuguese. So if you have, um, whether it's an alumni or whatever it is, if you have somebody that has an understanding of Brazilian Portuguese, this will help you a lot. It really will in order to understand and and to find out where people are based. And um, so you have the the INCTs, which I already mentioned. Then you have the Lattice platform. The Lattice platform is basically a platform of. Um, of researchers, it's the it's the professional um, resume, the pro professional CV or curriculum of um, of all researchers, Brazilian researchers that have received funding from from CNPq. So they're all registered there. Anybody you want to know, you just put their name in, it'll all appear. It is generally in Portuguese, so in order to kind of get an idea of where these guys are coming from, um, it would be a good idea to have some help with that. Um, CMPQ also offer um, a research groups database. So again, it's in Portuguese, but you can you search by keyword, search by location, and, and find an idea of where our research is based, and get an idea, I suppose, of what are the research groups that, that, that exist here in Brazil. Um, and you also have the institutions of science and technology, which we passed a slide on that a little while ago as well. Um, and that brings me pretty much to the end of, um, of my presentation. It has been a huge amount of information. I appreciate that. Um, the, the thing about Brazil, I suppose, is there's a huge amount going on here. There's a huge amount of, um, of funding available. You need, you need patience. Brazil is not a short game, a medium term game. It's a long game. So if you want to engage here, you need to be willing to stay here for, for a you need to be willing to stay for five, ten years. You need to be willing to stay to play to play the long game, to to create partnerships, 
partnerships start with personal partnerships there needs to be a level of trust between yourself and your potential partner and you develop them from that and um, is Brazil worthwhile absolutely there's a lot of fascinating stuff going on here a lot of fascinating research going on here there is a there, there's a need for um, Brazil is a country in development um, in rapid development some areas more rapid than others some infrastructure frustrations definitely um, power cuts and um, things like that are, are things that, that, that we live with here in Brazil and um, bureaucracy can be a problem but these things the Brazilian authorities are very much trying to address and um, address these issues and with the amount of funding that's available and with in, with well-meaning and intelligent and thought out plans and partnerships I think being part of this development will be will be fascinating and will be very very worthwhile for all of us going forward thank you very much for your time and <laughs> I hope it wasn't too much information for everybody thanks so much Sarah that was great I mean as you say a lot of information um, absorb a lot to absorb let me just reassure everybody that this presentation the recording of the actual of Sarah herself and, and the president will be made available by a link in two or three days time. So um, you'll be able to share it with colleagues and catch up on the bits that you missed. Uh, please send us questions through the uh, through the DAT and uh, while we won't be able to deal with them all in the time available, uh, we will, when we send out the link to the, uh, to the presentation, also send a list of answers as best we can to the points you raised. So please feel free to send out your, your questions, queries, observations, and we will share our answers with you um, in a few days' time. I've got a few questions which I think I can take up. Uh, so if you can perhaps uh, be prepared <laughs> for a few things. But before we before we hit the questions, let's do another, let's do another quick poll question. Um, this is perhaps most addressed to those of you who already have some sort of research links with Brazil. Uh, and the, uh, the question uh, is, coming up now, um, does your institution have research links with Brazil? Uh, we basically just to get a, an idea of, of the spread of, of, uh, of links amongst our audience. So none at all, a few or many. Uh, so if you've got a few seconds to this, we'll share the answer with you in a little while. will disappear from your screen so it already has okay uh, so Sarah first question for you um, talking about finding good research partners in Brazil um, you've given us a good feel for where to start look for funding for, for possible links but actually finding individual we all know that you know research flourishes between individual connections um, What's the best route you would suggest for finding a really good a research partner in Brazil? I, th I think, um, first of all, I think it's very important to take a multifaceted approach here to Brazil. I think you, you can't, you can't um, realistically take, take one path and think that that will necessarily need, lead you to, to Mecca. Um, a, a multifaceted approach is a good idea. Um, I would recommend, I mean, you can, you can take a certain amount of credence from, from the ranking systems here and have a look at the better universities for a start, maybe, even though I suppose I should add with that that a lot of the time, um, certainly this is what Brazilian universities would suggest, and, and, and I think it is a reasonable explanation, a lot of the time, um, many Brazilian universities don't figure high in world rankings. Um, for, for the sheer lack of um, information gathering, often their information gathering and their statistic gathering um, is not well organized as of yet. Um, so they have these people coming looking for various um, various stats in various different metrics. And oftentimes the, the chemistry department isn't talking to the central department. And, you know, if you look at, uh, I was talking to people in Unicamp recently and they said, you know, if you were to believe our official stats, We've got 500 outward mobility um, researchers last year, but I had 500 in my department. So how could it possibly be that you know the whole university has only had that? So a lot of the time, the stats aren't gathered very well. So you can look at the rankings; they'll give you a general idea of the better ones. But by and large, most of the federal universities, state universities, um, do have access to good funding, so do have good research and um, going on. So again, it's looking into these databases um, and it's looking to see. 
I mean, you put in some keywords and then you look at their, their, their CV online will give you a very, very good idea of how active these, these, how many publications they've had, what kind of projects have they been involved in. Um, I would very strongly say use your alumni to, to help you to get access to institutions. Um, and again, I suppose I mentioned this, but when kind of institutional partnerships are very, very important. And oftentimes you might identify an excellent uh, researcher, for example, in the Federal University of Pernambuco. Um, before he can necessarily engage with you, there would be probably an expectation that either his department or his university would have an institutional agreement with your institution or with your department. Brazil is a hugely bureaucratic um, country. Nothing happens without reams of paperwork, probably because they have the Amazon here, so there's plenty of trees, I don't know. But um, um, there's reams of paperwork, unfortunately, that, that accompany absolutely everything. Um, a lot of the time, the paperwork is almost like a handshake. We, we meet somebody, we shake their hands. A lot of the time, the paperwork is a handshake. But I would recommend that um, when you're signing institutional agreements, uh, whether that's from your international office or, or where, wherever the institutional agreement is coming from, just, just be aware of the content. If there's an expectation within that agreement to have reciprocal exchange of students, are you willing to, to receive students? Are you willing to, to send students? So just, um, there's, there's a saying here in, in, in Brazil, um, convenio de governo, um, memorandums that are thrown in the drawer. So some universities they have on their websites that they have, you know, 900 international collaborations. They're all sitting in a file somewhere. They've actually maybe three that are actually working. If you come with an empty dead agreement, you're not going to be very well received with that. So I suppose I would just encourage um, to, while acknowledging that it's just it's it's just a, a formalized handshake in some ways. But I think putting thought into into an MOU and putting an action plan and a timeline into an MOU. Will, it will just bring you so so high up in the estimation of these partners that you're actually serious, you actually want to do business, okay, where do we start? You know, so I mean, that's a good way to kind of to bring the universities on board here, particularly when you're looking in, in the golden triangle, as I call them, or the big three, uh, where these people have delegations coming from overseas, three a day, t you know, 10 a week, whatever it might be. So, um, there's a lot of, unfortunately, there's a lot of delving through a lot of um, information to, to, to be done. But again, I would encourage if you have a Brazilian uh, Portuguese speaker on board, this will be crucial to help you um, to help you decipher the, the, the information. And from then, it's personal partnerships. From then, you, 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 get to know, you get to know the researcher and you develop it from there. Right. No, I think those are very important points. So... And I think you know, one of the things that, that uh, we've, we've experienced uh, is that it's also important to look inwards as well into your own institution and make sure you're set up to actually generate the flow of communication with Brazil for, for partnerships. Um, the most successful ones is perhaps and will have their own Brazil group, which brings together uh, academics and others interested in, in the Brazil connection who meet regularly and, and make sure that the, the flow continues. Um, yeah, it's important to know your own research priorities, who in your own, in your own academic faculties are most likely to be interested. Uh, and, and find also opportunities for them to meet up with Brazilian researchers who are traveling internationally much, much more now. Uh, there are also learning societies and associations, as I say, the Brazilian Chemical Association and so on meets annually, you know, these are good opportunities, even if you can't send a researcher there to send a Portuguese speaking alumni to go there and make uh, with the flesh and uh, make the contacts there. Um, you know, the personal contact, as, it, as in most places, is very important. Uh, but once you make it, you can find yourself opening up doors and, um, and reaching uh, some surprising opportunities um, through your partners. And I think it's the surprises which are, are always exciting in Brazil. And there's, um, but if you persist, you will find some very pleasant ones. Um, one, point, one question for you, Sarah, which um, you're talking about the flow of funds from state uh, tax revenue to the FAPs. Do they have to spend it in year or do they build research, research um, reserve funds? I mean, do they, does their funding go up and down like a yo-yo or, or can they keep it fairly stable? 
Um, well, it, it depends on how the economy, the local economy is going, really, Stephen. So, I mean, the, the, the I mean, the, the, the numbers that I would have quoted would be kind of the, the annual budget or the annual spend of each of the FAPIs. I mean, obviously, it does, um, it does, uh, it does fluctuate depending on what the tax income is is of that year. But no, generally, generally, they would they would spend the available budget. So I suppose, kind of, you know, they would have their own checks and balances. Um, they would allocate a certain proportion to mobility, a certain propor proportion to actual research projects, and, and so on and so forth. Okay, thanks. I mean, certainly speaking to the FAPESPI, the big one in Sao Paulo, they they do try and make it clear to possible partners that, you know, they do try and smooth out the, the ups and downs. And um, for instance, if they're funding a, a, a Brazilian researcher to spend time in, in the university overseas, they're not just going to cut off funding because there's been a, a bit of a drop in income. They have got enough reserves, I think, to keep things um, moving in certainly do, the sorry, no, they, they do. They do for sure, Stephen. Yeah, I mean, what we found um, at the start of this year was um, several kind of things that are that are kind of happening at the same time here in Brazil. Um, um, kind of a little bit of political unrest and, and and so on and so forth, and the economy not maybe performing as well as it had done. So what we found um, with some of the FAPIs was that, um, and, and with, with CMPQ as well, is that budgets were, were frozen for a period of time. But very much, I mean, if, if, if they sign a contract and they, they're going to send somebody overseas, that money is set aside, that money is available. It may not, sometimes, sometimes it, it's paused for a while, they need to keep it, they need to keep it you know, in their current account as such for a period of time, but they will honor their commitments. I mean, the value of this horrible bureaucracy that I mentioned is that they're bound by law. They're they're entering into contracts, so they're not going. To, they're not going to renege. They may delay, but they're not going to renege. That certainly would be my experience, in my opinion. That's 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 an important point. Thanks. Um, a few more questions for you coming in now. Um, is it possible to have more than one FAPI involved in the same project? You know, can you bring in researchers from more than one state easily, or is it a pain? Um, there's, there's no, essentially, there's no reason why not. Um, now, the, there is a certain level of competition between the FAPIs, certainly between the bigger players. Um, and if there's anything going to happen, they will want it to happen in their own state, um, if you're talking about a large scientific event or whatever it might be. Um, but certainly in our experience, um, we at Research Brazil Ireland, um, we we developed I and mean, we, it's only a new pro program. It was launched two years ago, and um, but we developed working groups. And our working groups would one of our ideas um, with the working groups was that we would, would be that we would have collaboration between um, not only between Brazil and Ireland, but within Brazil and within Ireland. So most of our working groups now would have two or three um, partners from from uh, as in Irish university partners, so two or three different Irish universities or institu institutes of technology as well as two or three um, Brazilian university partners. Um, I, don't, I, don't see, I don't see why not. In, in, that, in, that, um, in that scenario, what would most likely happen, again, if you remember that if you're working in partnership with the FAPIs, you will be paying for your researcher, uh, your research and your researcher's costs, and they will be paying for theirs. So if you bring two FAPIs, one FAPI looks after what's, what's going on, for, what's relevant within their state, and the other will, will do the same within their state. I, I, yeah. they, they work together, they work together. I mentioned the umbrella organization called FAPI. Um, There's 25 funding agencies, they have um, bi-monthly meetings, and they very much want to work together. And they have recently actually, which is again a great, um, a, a great, a great sign, I suppose, um, they have recently developed um, a position or a post for, for somebody responsible for international cooperation. They didn't have that in the past. They do now. It's a former president of FAPI Migi that has taken on that role. Um, so CONFAPI, as a combined force of 25 funding agencies, they want international partnerships. They're open for business. They want to engage. Um, there's, and there's, there's a lot going on. I would use CONFAPI as a way to communicate with all of them, but I would see but certainly with the smaller FAPIs at a smaller state, and when I say smaller, I mean with the smaller amounts of funds available, they will be eager to, to, to engage and it won't be a problem. The bigger ones, I'm not quite so sure, but I, again, I don't see any reason so long as, as long as the, the paperwork and the bureaucracy is very, very clear as to who will own the intellectual property, et cetera. The, the, these are the important parts. After that, everybody's going to be happy. All right, good, thank you. Um, 
just perhaps look at another another question. You um, you had earlier this year a Brazil Island Science Week, the first Brazil Science Science Week, which was a collaboration and, and co-funded, I believe, between Brazil and Ireland. Um, was it worthwhile? Absolutely. Um, it was absolutely great. Um, our idea was uh, we'd been we'd been operating for over a year. We had developed developed a lot of partnerships, and we had developed a lot of working groups, as I already mentioned. And the idea was um, within Research Brazil Ireland. Since we've started, we've had a mobility of uh, we've sent about a hundred. I think it's one hundred and ten Irish researchers out here to Brazil. We've had about a hundred uh, researchers come and visit us um, in Ireland. Aside from the conference. Our idea with the conference was, okay, why not get together all of these partners that are very much interested in this consortium, interested in this engagement between Brazil and Ireland, why don't we get them all into one place? Um, we called the conference Collaborative Research for a Better Future. So while it was the first Brazil Ireland Science Week, it wasn't a science conference per se. It was a lot of the time looking at kind of science policy and in order for our Irish researchers to understand the Brazilian backdrop and in order for the Brazilian um, researchers to not only, not only understand the Irish backdrop, but also to understand the European backdrop and the availability of Horizon 2020 funding um, and, and, and several aspects like that. So um, when, when we kind of came up with this great plan of bringing researchers over, we had a plan to maybe bring 20 or 30 Brazilian researchers to Ireland. Um, in February, we had 85 Brazilian, senior Brazilian researchers in Dublin Castle um, for a week-long event. And we also had three funding agency presidents. We had the, the president of Fapergi, Fapesti, and also the president of Confapi. So I suppose for ourselves, we were delighted to see such interest from Brazil in engaging. I think the fact that we were proactive when Science Without Borders was launched, the fact that we came up with this initiative called Research Brazil Ireland, the fact that we're making funding available and we're not we're we're, we're encouraging this mobility without necessarily depending on the Brazilian coffers. We're we're showing off, we're we're showing that we have available budgets. So I think this was very much taken on board by the funding agencies and the fact that three of them were willing to make the you know, it's not a short journey to get to Ireland. Um, the fact that they were willing to make that journey was great for us. So I suppose we had we had the 85 Brazilian researchers. We also had 200 Irish researchers that participated over the few days. Um, so it was fantastic um, in terms of in, in terms of the energy that was there and um, the ideas. We we built in um, we built in a, a session for for pitching new ideas. So giving researchers that may be looking for um, collaborations and new ideas or might have new and exciting uh, yeah, um, research ideas to promote. We gave them a platform on which to do that, which most found very, very helpful. But just, you can't underestimate the, the, the value of getting people into a room together. And I suppose you can, have, you can set, up, set up a wonderful schedule of events for a conference but oftentimes, no, no more than in any other sector, oftentimes the business is done over dinner, over lunch, over coffee. So I suppose having everybody together for a few days like this, I mean, the feedback from our Irish researchers has been hugely positive. The feedback from Brazilian researchers has been amazing and from the funding agency presidents as well. Um, so a lot, a lot has come from that in terms of um, applications for, for, for funding in Europe, for example, uh, new working groups. There's, there's, there's a lot of there's a lot of things that are budding from 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 Research Brazil or from the Brazil Ireland Science Week. Also, I suppose for our Irish researchers um, and for anybody who's listening um, or watching for for your own research, I suppose for us. Um, demonstrating that this many Brazilian researchers were willing to travel to Ireland. Now we did have we did have help from the funding agencies, several of the funding agencies in terms of paying for this mobility. But in fact it just it shows a great um it shows a great interest, it shows a great in, in enthusiasm and it shows a great engagement. Um, so I mean already the funding agencies are talking about the second Brazil Ireland Science Week that they'd like to host here in Brazil. Um, so so we'll see how that goes. But um, no, it was it was an absolutely amazing event. And what we did a final day of the of the conference was we most of the conference was in a conference center as such. The final day of the conference we offered all of our consortium members the the option to host a day within their own institution because I think I certainly I can speak for for Irish um, Irish labs. We have very very high tech labs. We have very very well equipped labs. We have uh, amazing um, cutting edge um, equipment available to us um, within our labs. So bringing these researchers all the way to Ireland to sit in a conference centre is fantastic. 
but we need to bring them into the labs. We need to show them what we have as well. So that was, that, that was a fantastic one for us as well, because I suppose our Irish universities, um, innovation is a big thing for us. Um, most of our universities would have innovation centers and our, our institutes of technology would have innovation centers on campus. Innovation, we have an innovation law here in Brazil, but innovation is not as, it, it hasn't progressed as far as they would like yet. Um, so Brazil is very keen to learn from international partners in this space. I think certainly speaking from an Irish perspective, we have a huge amount to share in terms of what went right and what went wrong, mistakes we made, what we would do again, what we wouldn't go near again, different things like that. So I suppose um, absolutely money well spent and absolutely um, uh, the results, the results, the repercussions are still, we're still hearing about repercussions all the time. Some universities uh, went on after the event to um, to host Irish events on campus, various different initiatives that we're, that we're seeing here. So definitely it was worthwhile, yeah. Great, great. No, thanks. I'm so glad. A lot of effort to put these things together, but when you get such enthusiasm, then it's great to see the results. Um, I'm getting quite a lot of questions from your friends and colleagues in Ireland, which I think if, you know, I'll feed to you afterwards and then <laughs> about you know, how can they find out calls for proposals and so on. So I think we'll feed that to you. Um, I think just perhaps I just had one quick point that um, when you do sign memorandums of understandings with one of the FAPs, um, an interesting what they often propose, and this is, is an interesting way forward, is a mini seminar, perhaps bringing together your some of your more interested researchers with uh, people from Brazil who they will invite to do a mini seminar on a particular area or group of areas of interest to build uh, build those links. Uh, in, in an interesting atmosphere, and they uh, they're very keen to do that. So don't feel that it has to be one-to-one -one researcher level links from the word go. You know, those could be can be um, put together in collaboration with these fabs. Uh, that point I make is uh, you were talking about glistening wonderful machinery in your in your laboratories in Ireland. Um, you visit a university or an institution in Brazil. Uh, don't be put off if perhaps there's some crumbling concrete outside or a leaking roof because they are focusing funding on equipment often. Uh, fascinating visit I made a few weeks ago, penetrated through what looked like a, I don't know, a bombed out building, but in the heart of that building was some really world class machinery humming and clicking away with some very engaged uh, young scientists. Interestingly, 50 50 male female. <laughs> so I'm glad. Uh, that's something. That's another whole topic for us: is is science and and, uh, and women in in Brazil. Um, so you know, the, you will find um, some top class facilities available. Uh, industry is something. The whole area we haven't discussed is the in any detail is the role of industry in Brazil, and they will often uh, come in, in particularly to fund equipment. Um, Time for one very quick question. Oh, we're almost out of time now. Um, I might just I might just add in there, Stephen, if we have time. Um, you were mentioning about um, mini workshops and that kind of thing. I suppose for anybody listening within the within the European Union, um, there is an initiative that the EU, based here in Brazil, um, are very active in 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 um, organising and coordinating. It's an initiative called Tour of Brazil. And Tour of Brazil, normally one member state will take responsibility for coordinating, for organizing and coordinating. Um, one member state will hold an event here in Brazil on one specific scientific area. That may be ICT, that may be um, um, blue growth, whatever it might be. And the and will link with one Brazilian state here. So that Brazilian state will gather together all of their best minds from industry and university in that area. And the expectation would be that um, the, the European states would bring also their best minds from, from universities and industry. This is a great way. If you've got a niche area, if you've got an area you want to push, try and talk with your with your embassy here in Brazil to see can you host a tour of Brazil and identify what area you would like to, to host that tour of Brazil in. And just one other very quick point, if you mind, Stephen, is uh, if you're at any stage trying to, to, to visit here, if you want to bring any kind of equipment, tread very carefully. We have a lot of researchers that attempted to come here to engage in short research um, programs. They couldn't get their equipment through customs. So just do your research, talk to your consular staff here on the ground, find out the paperwork that needs to be filled or exactly what you have to do to make it happen. Okay, thanks. Look, uh... 
So we pretty well run out of time now. So I don't think we have time even for another poll question or anything. But we've got lots of, of questions from people. We'll reply to all these. Um, we have put up this uh, this uh, webinar online with the slide presentation. And rest assured, this isn't just going to be a one-off uh, one-off presentation. We'll revisit specific aspects of science and innovation in Brazil in a future webinars uh, and build a dialogue. Uh, we're available. All of Sarah is more than happy to share her experiences. Um, I hope she's given you an appetite to either start more collaboration with Brazil or deepen what you already, already exists. Um, uh, I, thanks very much again, Sarah, for all the information you've given us. Um, and I wish you yeah, very success with the second Brazil Island Research Seminar when that comes up. Thank you very much, Stephen. Thanks for the invitation. Thank you very much, Bye for now.